Amanda, it's going to be when Jesus came into the world. In John chapter 1, verse 10, he, and of course the context is about Jesus, uh, the word, first begins with the word, uh, it doesn't really say anything uh, about Jesus un until uh, well, later on. This chapter is about the word, and it finally says Christ. Let's see. Um, I was looking. Let's still, oh, it comes down to word, down to about verse, um, I think Christ is in verse uh 20. Uh, let's see if it goes up. I'm, I might miss it. If you see it, that's fine. But anyway, in verse 10, he, the word, which we know to be Jesus, he is the word. It said, he came into the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. And that's two statements that are, you know, when you think about them. The world was made by him. This is the creator of heaven and earth. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 1 that God made the world by him. And of course, it, it, God said that's the word. If it says God said it's the word, and if, if it's the word, it's Jesus. And these three are one and First John chapter 5. And so the world knew him not. Uh that tells you the condition of the world from sin, from uh, wherefore is by one man sin in the world. <clears throat> the world changed once the children are born of Adam because of the nature of sin. And the the idea, well, I, I need to read it. Turn to Acts. That might be a good, good thing. Um, I believe Acts 17 may be the one I want. In Acts 17, where Paul is preaching at Athens, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. And that's the same thing that made him mad at Stephen as the lost man Saul. Uh, Stephen preached the same thing in Acts 7. Verse 25, neither is worshiped with men's hand as though he needed anything. And uh, I love it when God needs your help. I, I hear that on TV. God don't need your help. I mean, that's just absolutely. God made the world all things there and seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hand. Neither is worships with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And that's what the world's supposed to be giving him the glory of and the uh, praise of. And verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. That's not where they live as far as on the dry land. It's where they live on dry land. Uh, we don't live under the sea and we don't live in space. And God doesn't say that that person in that country has to stay in that country. That's not what he's saying. That's saying at all. And a lot of people have used that verse to segregate in their opinions of people, but that's not what the verse said at all. But now verse 27, he, he that made the world that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now go back to John 1 and watch. In all the viewing of the, the word, the, uh, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost before the foundation of the world, and I, as they looked at the world, none of, none of the things that happened are a mystery to God. We know that. He saw it all. But <clears throat> as they looked at it, and you, I, it's hard to say what I'm going to say, but you can't imagine what they saw, how they felt from the day of creation to now, let's say, because while well, we were not in the future, obviously, what they saw and what man had done with their creation. 
but they knew it was going to happen and they let it happen because God wanted you and I. He saw before the foundation of the world that if he called, he made a calling that he knew who would hear it and receive it. I can claim that myself. I heard the gospel preached. I claim it. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven for Christ's sake. On and on. But in that seeing before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter one, verse three and four, what they had, what they saw, the world did to his creation or to their creation, because Genesis 1 let us make man in our image. And he said, the world, he, he, there's a time when Jesus is going to come into the world, come from the glory of the Father, into a body that God made for him. And he's going to live among men. And, and to know what they're going to do to him. And allowing it. That, that's what overwhelms me is he allowed it to happen because the purpose of God. And he came to do the will of the Father. And then when he, as he prayed, dear Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. That, it's called strong prayer and supplications in the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The will of the Lord was to live. The will of the Lord was to not suffer. I mean, he didn't want to suffer. He allowed it because he wrote about it because he saw it. I mean, if you're worried about something right now, quit. I got a chance to talk to a lady in the dentist as, as I was waiting for my wife. She was having a root canal the other day, and I witnessed these, uh, this uh, uh, lady, and she accepted the witness. She didn't turn it down. She didn't get mad. And, and, I, and I said, you know, that God saw the races of people, and he saw what the races of people would do. And how they would segregate and how they would do this and how they would have attitude and judgment and everything. And I said, there's one thing you need to know in this world. Stop feeling guilty for being born. And stop feeling guilty for having the nature you have. And allow God, who saw it all, and took care of it if we want him to, said, let him have forgiven you for Christ's sake. Let him have saved you for what Christ did. And stop feeling guilty and always trying to repent or confess or rededicate because you think you're backslidden. I said, what'd you backslide from? And I said, quit feeling guilty and accept the peace of God, which is available if we want it. There, I, I looked at the lady, she had got a big smile on her face. She's my goodness. That's the truth, isn't it? And I said, yes, it's the truth. So many people walk around with guilt all the time, and they try to get it right in church. And church is not going to set it right. It's always going to be preaching on something and then getting you to feel guilty enough to keep continue coming or keep continue giving or always rededicating or putting you to work in the church because you do have the guilt. It shouldn't be a guilt going to a Bible study. It should be a pleasure. It shouldn't be a guilt. Oh, I don't, I need to go, but I can't to go and do a, a get-together, fellowship, happiness, word of God, pleasure from the word. There's great pleasure in his word. But in John 1.10, he said he was in the world and the world was made by him, the creator. You know, Peter talks about they had him in their presence. And even that, 
there was more sure word of prophecy. The Bible should be your best friend. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about uh, God is closer to the stick of closer to a brother. He's a friend. I'm not talking about eliminating that. I'm saying this Bible ought to be your best friend, your best comfort, and actually have a complete trust in what God says. Hold a John, go to Romans 15. You know, I don't know whether people, what they think about the Bible sometimes. A lot of people never open their Bible once a week. Uh, now we have Zoom twice a week. I don't know what people do. I, I don't really don't. Uh, that's not none of my business, obviously. But in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things written a four time written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Comfort. Comfort. Patience. And it comes of the scriptures. Why? Whatever he wrote before, he tells us things in there. But then we get to Romans uh, through Philemon, written by Paul, directly to us. And I told the lady, I said, here's how the Bible works. I said, if you go to your mailbox and you've got a letter in there and it doesn't have your name on it. And you open it up and read it and you don't understand it. It wasn't sent to you. And if it wasn't sent to you, you're not going to understand somebody talking about their history of their family or their troubles they're having, all that. And you go, who in the world? It didn't have your name on it. And that's that's the problem with the Bible with people. They go to passages that are not theirs and they claim it to the full extent and they can't have it. Uh, it's like Acts chapter 2 versus Joel 2. Peter quotes Joel 2. But he doesn't quote it exact because he adds a word of where he'll pour out his spirit. Joel, in Acts 2, it says he'll pour out of his spirit. Not all the spirit of Joel is being poured out in Acts chapter 2. But why? Because God's not ready for Joel to come into effect. He's got that on hold because, one, he's choosing out a new priesthood in Acts chapter 2, the royal priesthood of 1 Peter chapter 3. And then he's going to come to the body, the dispensation of grace, which he accounts as foreknowledge before the foundation of the world, had us in his mind, had us in his will, had us in his purpose. And then when the body leaves, which he talks about it, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, when the body leaves, then he will begin the stuff, the process where Joel will finally come in full prophecy. That's not impossible. That's not hard. If you believe the Bible and read the Bible and trust about what it says, God knows how to spell. God knows how to use words. God knows what he wants to say and does. And so he gave us the inspired word. And as we read it, we can have patience, and comfort. Now go back to John 1 again. I, sometimes I get off a little bit. In Genesis, uh, John chapter 1, verse 10, he, God's son, the word, came in the world. Uh, look at verse 14. And the word was made flesh. Well, the word is, is Jesus, obviously. He came into the world, the word was made flesh, <clears throat> verse 10, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. I mean, he didn't come into a place that's going to welcome him as the creator. Uh, let's just look at some things. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And we know what they did to the prophets. They killed them. Hath in these last days spoken. See, if everything had been right, well, number one, if everything had been right, they wouldn't even been in need for prophets. If everything had been right, 
the world would live in harmony with God. Because uh, Acts chapter 7, that they might happily seek after him, though he be not far from them. Uh, man are to seek God. Well, Romans 3.10, there's none that seeketh after God. Very clear. Why? Because of the, the uh, condition of the world that knew him not. And when you think about the virgin birth prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, there's a man that spoke of the birth of Christ in Luke 2. His name is Simon. And he was waiting, and it's like when God sent John before Jesus. He was baptizing, making Jesus manifest to Israel. He was getting them ready. He's there. The Messiah is with you. The king of the Jews is here. The prophecy of Isaiah 14 has been fulfilled. Jesus is with us. And the ones that repented and got baptized were being identified with the Lord. Then Jesus came to John and took the baptism of John, fulfilling all righteousness, and the Spirit descended like a dove, lit upon him and said, Behold, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Moses had spoken in Deuteronomy about the prophet that should, they should listen to. Well, the history is they had killed all the prophets. That's Acts 17, I believe. Uh, let me check here. I want to make sure. No, uh, that was Acts 7. I apologize. In Acts 7, where Stephen said, uh, which verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Stephen preaches basically the same thing that Peter does in Acts 2 and 3, 4. You kill the holy one. You, you kill the just one. The, the one that came, you, you didn't want him. We have no king but Caesar crucified. So when Jesus came in the world, he came into the world to be the king. He came in the world to set the kingdom up. And he said, if you'll uh, repent, I will not sacrifice. That was his purpose coming according to Israel. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's read that and see what the difference is. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, with Paul's message is, uh, verse 14, uh, 15, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. He came to set the kingdom up for Israel to sit on the throne of David. But if you, I mean, you can, there's, it's absolutely assured. If you look, if Jesus came into the world to sit on the throne of David, which was prophesied in David, in the Psalms, if you kill him, then the kingdom is delayed. And that's what the devil wanted. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2. 1 Corinthians 2. The whole thing that Paul relates to is a mystery to the devil. That's why the devil hates Paul with everything that's possible and it goes against anybody that's with Paul that be follows me as also a Christ. Uh, Christ revealed to Paul the revelation of Romans through Philemon, gave him scriptures at first to the prophets, and then he came to Ephesians and Colossians. He took him up to the third heaven as in 2 Corinthians 12, and revealed to him unspeakable words, unlawful to be uttered, which probably was Ephesians and Colossians, because Ephesians and Colossians are one of the two of the most incredible books that you can read in the Bible, that they, they come down from heaven. They're like a high calling. And they come down, and you the blessedness of it is that we're born in the world that we can read Ephesians and Colossians. I mean, they're incredible books. It gives our past, our future, 
it, what God did for us. You see, some people say, well, I never knew I was sealed. That's why. Because they never had Ephesians preached at them. They never had Ephesians revealed to them by the preaching. Why? They're always busy in the Old Testament, reading in the Old Testament, which blinds them. And, and the true revelation given to Paul, the, the mystery in the mystery, let's say it that way, the mystery of Christ, here it is. Now watch, the mystery of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of the world, princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. What is it, Paul? Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Ah, there it is. Before the world unto us. We are to be the happiest people. I mean, you are to turn on Zoom and be happy and going, yes, we're going to find out more about what God saw before the foundation for, of the world for us. I mean, he tells us about all the spiritual uh, blessings in heaven. place. He tells us of all things here uh, in verse uh, 12 that He might, uh, we might know the things that are freely given to us. We find out the free things such as righteousness, justification, salvation, glorification, all the things he gave us by grace. Unearned. Un, uh, the word escaped me. Undeserving. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve the grace of God. It's a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself to give to God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't have to worry about your works taking or giving you salvation. Salvation by grace. It's a gift. You know, if you have guilt, if there's something making you feel good, you just quit. But the guilt is trying to get you to do something to deny the faith and not obey the faith and the truth. The truth is, I stand before you, chief of sinners like Paul, undeserving of God's salvation, but the mercy of God saved me by his grace. And God's mercy is overwhelming. And I'm going to do a message on mercy one of these days and and I think about the mercy of God, even for his loved ones that die. Precious in the eyes of the Lord, the death of his saints. That's comfort. Now watch, verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, I apologize. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Something that Paul had revealed to him that he revealed in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now I'm going to do something else. Hold that just a second. Go to Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. Of course it didn't. First Corinthians 2 will not allow that. Nobody knew. No man knew. The devil didn't know. The princes of this world do not. not neither, uh, uh, I certify the brethren that the gospel which preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now you understand, Peter's message came before Paul. And if Peter and Paul's message are the same, then Peter revealed it to him. And Peter's a man. No. The message revealed to Paul is a mystery. And that's what I'm trying to get over to you here in the fact that Peter's message was revealed to him by the Lord himself. Paul's message. No, I apologize. Peter's message was revealed to him by the Lord's teaching and then being with them on in on the uh, uh, chapter one of Acts 
pertain to the kingdom of God. His message became the gospel, the circumcision. And all he's preaching is the fact that when Jesus died and rose, it proved him to be the son of God. And you have crucified, slain, and killed the just one, the holy one, on and on. But God's given you a chance of repentance because Jesus asked for it. Paul's preaching came from a high calling. Jesus is in heaven. He didn't teach Paul on earth. Neither did Peter. Because if Peter taught Paul the gospel, then Paul's lying in Galatians 1. And if Galatians 1 is a lie, I quit right now. I'm done. If, if what I read is a lie, I'm done. But it ain't. God cannot lie. And Paul said, by the leadership of the Spirit, I, the gospel which he preached to me is not after man. I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed later, not to Peter, but to Paul, this in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. Now, Matthew is Romans 10, 13, 14, and 15. Okay. By which also you're saved. So there ain't no doubt about anything right here. The gospel that Paul preaches saves. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 2, you'll see how salvation comes. Hold here, go to Acts 2. Now, this is how salvation comes in Acts 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Well, let's just back up. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, men in, You men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith the Lord God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Joel did not use the word of. The reference here, God is not going to pour out the entire prophecy spirit of Joel right then. Why? Again. You're choosing out a priesthood. You're choosing out the body of Christ. The body of Christ has got to leave. Then the prophecy of Joel can come about. That's 2,000 years has, has come past, and Joel's prophecy hadn't been fulfilled yet. 2,000 years, and Joel's prophecy still hadn't been fulfilled. This is the of, and if you, if you want to go and read it, it's in Joel chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, eight, I believe it is, 28 to 32. The word of is not in Joel 2, okay? And your sons and your daughters shall prophecy. Young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days again the word of. Why? God is not going to set the kingdom up yet. It is not time for the kingdom. How do I know? Go back to Acts 1, 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father put in his own power, but you shall receive power, Acts 2, uh, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. As he just told them, you're going to do, you're going to do what I called you to do. And when you do it, we can see by the scriptures that there comes a time when Peter and Paul shook hands, go to Galatians chapter two, hold on first Corinthians 15 in Galatians chapter two, the Lord sent Paul up to Jerusalem again, 14 years later, matter of fact. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem, verse 1, Galatians 2, 1. 
with Barnabas, took Titus with me also. And you can check this out. Barnabas is still with him. So that's Acts 14 at least. Before, uh, before 15. And it's 15, but it's Barnabas still with him, okay? Because Barnabas and Paul split. All right. And I went up by revelation, communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Remember, Paul is separated in Acts 13. And in that separation, his true apostleship is going to be working. He's the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11. His gospel is called in verse 7, but contrawise when they saw that the gospel, the uncircumcision was commanded unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. We have before the cross, the message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is there. Let him sit on the throne. They won't let him. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. They will not let Jesus sit on the throne. And that's the prophecy of Peter, of, of David. And instead, they want him crucified. And they said, let his blood be on us and our children. And God allows that crucifixion. He's allowing them to deny the Lord. He's not forcing them to accept the Lord. He's allowing them to not accept the Lord, not let him sit on the throne of David because he's going to let him be crucified for us. But he's also letting him become a curse for them. That's Galatians chapter three. Now, Jesus is not going to sit on the throne. So he dies, he's buried, and he rises. He goes up to heaven and he presents us holy and without blame. He leads us captivity, Ephesians 4. He comes back down and spends 40 days with the apostles. Now he's pertaining to the kingdom of God, which is he's in. And so their message changed from the kingdom of heaven to the gospel of the circumcision. What is the gospel of the circumcision? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For well, the promise is unto you. Israel. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. He's given them a chance of repentance after he is crucified, buried, and rises. After he teaches the apostles for 40 days. And then in Acts chapter 1, he ascends up off the Mount of Olives where they've asked, will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he says, not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father put in his own hand. And he left them. And they went into Jerusalem for seven days. And waited in a day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts 2, 1, the ghost came on them. And they began to do the ministry that Jesus had taught them to take care of. Why? They had ears to hear. And they'd been taught what to do. They just didn't know how. And they didn't know why. Because it was a mystery to them until the ghost was given to them until he breathed on them in Luke 24 to understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the scripture. Do you listen to me, folks? The reason people don't understand the King James Bible is because they don't have the spirit, the mind of Christ. And the only way they can handle it is retranslate into their own language. And it loses all the power there is involved in the King James. And it's called the spirit of the world. Translations are the spirit of the world, and they're the devil's words confusing people and keeping them from seeing the true truth of the cross of Christ. So that God, he don't, the devil don't want God to have foresaw those people. And yet, the gospel is the power of God, and it can absolutely overcome the blinding of Satan. But you have to let it. And that's where it comes down to preachers first. 
Preachers have to let the gospel of Christ be true and the power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believe it. For therein is the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What people are not submitting to is the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is without the law, and the righteousness of God is by the faith of Jesus Christ. Why don't people know about the faith of Christ? Because they got a Bible that doesn't present the faith of Christ, and they've never been shown it by the preachers that are so called called to God, and they're not. They're preachers of men, not men of God. They aren't called. They have taken this upon themselves because uh, a lot of them see the money involved. They don't have to work physically. You know, they can uh, go to uh monday uh sunday and wednesday and play golf and have good fellowship and everybody love them and everybody be kind to them buy them cars and houses you know and take good care of them and uh they uh they don't have to do it. they make good money over a hundred thousand probably i mean you know it's a good job and they don't have to worry about many things but a man of god he gets called and the first thing he knows, the devil is full bore on him, trying to get him to shut up, trying to hurt him, trying to do anything he can to keep him quiet because he's about to reveal the faith of God, the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of God, uh, faith of the Son, the faith of the Son. He said, uh, uh, I want to talk to you about that. Just say, look at Romans, uh, Romans chapter three. Now, you understand people that say they want to preach don't have any clue of what they're talking about. Now watch this. Um, Romans 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? A lot of them. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God? The faith of God. When did God ever have faith down here? His son. The faith of God. He said, make the faith of God without effect. No, God forbid. Let God be true and every man a liar. A man takes preaching on himself. And he's not concerned about the faith of Christ. His Bible says faith in. And if his Bible says faith of, he still doesn't promote that because he's still trying to get people to repent, confess, say the sinner's prayer, get baptized, join the church. People say it's all right to get baptized. Why is it all right? It's a wrong doctrine. Why is it okay to get baptized? Say it won't hurt you. But it might hurt your witness. And your witness is what counts. I tell people all the time, if you trusted the Lord, your witness is powerful. Because it makes people think if you tell them about it. It makes them think, say well, I don't want to upset them. Let them get upset. Let them get to the point that they're miserable enough that they trust the Lord. You know, people don't want to hurt people's feelings. I'd rather people's feelings got hurt here than their soul later. I, uh, as I was talking to that person in the dentist office, I, I didn't know how that would roll because in this day and age, people get mad and they'll try to sue you and everything else. Hey, God, take care of it. That's just the way it is. Well, just because people don't believe, it does not make the faith of God without effect. And so this preacher, he, man of God, he gets called. <clears throat> and God tells him, I ordained it that if you preach the gospel, you can live, I'll take care of you. But a lot of preachers can't handle that. That's fine. I'm not their judge. God take care of you. God said, I'll take care of you. I ordained it. If you preach that gospel, I'll, you can live of it. And I cannot tell you what changed my mind about that years ago. In 84, 85, well, a little bit before. 84, May 1784. 
I don't know what it was. But it was to live with the gospel. I never had any plans of a church. I was just going to go teach Bible classes. That's all I've ever wanted to do in the sense of the calling. When I came to Selma, Selma was a church, but to me, it's just a Bible study. It's my home place. It's the place I can live. I got to live somewhere. I don't own anything. I don't own a house. I don't own anything like that. I live in a applied house. People say, you're lazy. Well, that's, you can say whatever you want, but I teach five classes a week, sometimes six. I Zoom and everything. And I have never doubted the Lord about it. Paul said it's ordained day that preached the gospel of the God. And I have completely lived with the gospel. And I've got more things than I ever thought I'd even possess. And I live paying my bills. And I wait for the Lord to send the money to live on. And I'm not unhappy about that. But the men of God are called to preach the gospel that Paul knew, not the gospel of Peter, not the everlasting gospel of Revelation, but the gospel that Paul preached, which was called the gospel of the uncircumcision, following Paul as he was the follower of Christ. And in doing so, a mystery is revealed. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 2 and watch. It's sometimes a little aggravating. Some people make fun of my, at, a, at one of my Bible studies, I have a plate or the little jar. I bring in a jar, and if they want to put in, they can, and whatever. People make fun of it sometimes. It, hurt, it breaks my heart because people are having an attitude of, the Lord give me everything. And the fruit of it is to be used. I don't ask anybody for anything. So why make fun of it? Uh, I have a bill come up. I pray to the Lord. I lay it in the basket. And the Lord pays it. That's nothing to laugh about. He's my, you know, I've got the greatest employer in the world. Money means nothing to him. He doesn't worry about money. He owns it all in the first place. He can move anybody lost that he wants to to help me. He does it all the time. He moves lost people sometimes. I got the greatest employer in the world. Called of him to be his preacher. It's incredible. It absolutely makes me so happy to live of God because living of God, I can relate to you of the faithfulness of God. And I can try to uplift you that God loves you too. And that God is your heavenly father. And you can pray to him. You can supplicate to him. You can talk to him and he's listening and he's not mad at you. He's not angry with you unless obviously you get into idolatry and everything. That's the one thing that angers him. And he has scripture to correct you if you're wrong, not to kill you. God's not trying to kill you. The God's world's trying to kill you. The God's world is trying to shut you up. The God's world is trying to change your mind, affect your mind so that you can't be a witness. And we're part of that world that knew him not. But in the mercy of God, he called us. Please God, by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching. 
foolishness of preaching. How can it be the churches all preach of the cross? You see, Paul doesn't leave that blank. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross. Well, what is the preaching of the cross that's so foolish to everybody else? Your total forgiveness, your total redemption, your total glorification, your total justification, your total righteousness, your new creature, holy and without blame before him in love. You belong to him and nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Oh my God, folks. The cross is the power of God to save us. And we don't have to see the sun turned into darkness and the moon into blood and the things that Peter talked about of Joel in Acts chapter 2 to make a person call on the name of the Lord. What makes a person today call on the name of the Lord? Look at Acts, uh, Romans 10. Verse 13, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. Basically the same thing Peter said in Acts 2. But wait a minute. How then shall they call on him in whom they not believe? That tells me that in the dispensation of grace, no activity such as what's happening in Acts from Joel is going to happen. I don't need the stars, the moon to turn into blood. I don't need those things to go. What do I need? How then shall they call on him in whom they not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing. The faith of Christ comes. Our faith in him comes by the word of God. Turn to me Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. You'd figure that that might be a little bit blinded today in consideration of what you hear people talking about what they've done and joined the church by their backslide and they went back and uh they said the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus in the heart blah 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 but then also they say well he Jesus died for my sins how many all of them yeah well do you confess sins well absolutely sin is a transgression of the law and the right of God is without the law by the faith of Christ did you know about the faith of Christ no what do you mean the faith of Christ it's my faith no, it ain't. It's faith of Christ. You see, your faith is involved in this. Uh, Paul said for Corinthians 2 that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So you have to believe in something that's the power of God. Now watch this in Galatians 2.16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, be changed in every other translation, but the inspiration of King James it's in. The faith of Jesus Christ, okay? So justification comes by the faith of Christ. Uh, he delivered him for our office and raised him again for our justification. So by the faith of Christ. Hey, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus willingly gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Well, that he might deliver us from this present evil world and that we're not part of the world that knew him not. We're not part of the world, the whole creation that grown us in turbulence and pain, but we all are all we are also ourselves grown within ourselves because we have the first fruits of the spirit. We're looking to get out of the world, not to fix the world, not to stay in the world, not to have the world. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to inherit the earth. We don't want the earth. We don't want it. Our body wants to stay alive, but inside's a groaning. I want to get out of here. Please, Lord, it's time. Will you bring the rapture, uh, the, the catch out today? Will you bring it out? Now watch. He said, no, the man is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. All right, so justification by the faith of Christ. 
That's done. You can't mess that up. It's finished. It was finished 2,000 years ago. The devil can't mess it up. It's done. He can confuse. He can blind. He can stop you from seeing your justification done. Now read on. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus because we heard of what Jesus did. Hold this just a minute. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted. I trust that I'm justified. I trust that I'm glorified. I trust that I'm forgiven. I trust that I've been made righteous. I trust that I'm a new creature in Christ. Because God said so and he can't lie. In whom you also trust after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. You don't get that in religion. They're not going to tell you you're sealed because they want you to continue feeling like you need to do something to stay in the good graces of God. When all along you got a mediator up there, an intercessor for you, that's making intercession with your prayers because you don't know what to pray for and mediating for you because you're in the flesh. <clears throat> we're not in the flesh in the mind of God, but we're in the flesh in the body. And this body is an earthen vessel. And God gave us a treasure in this earthen vessel, and he allows us to walk in his good works. What a blessing. Ephesians 2.10 is a blessing. But now watch. He said, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit promise. All right. Now go back to Galatians 2 16. Knowing this, that a man, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ and his faith and what he did is established, done, and will never have to be done again. Okay. Even we have believed in Jesus. God called. Please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So he calls you. With this justification. It is God that justifies. Romans 8, 31, 32, and 33. It's God that justifies. So he calls it, Jerry, you're justified. Do you want it? Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Boom. Justified. Sealed. Secured. Member of the body of Christ. Baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. What does he tell me to do? Ephesians chapter 4. And this is all because Jesus Christ came in the world. The message to us, he came in the world to save sinners. I was a sinner. He came to save me as a sinner, me who had no hope without God, without Christ. By grace, God used the faith of Jesus Christ. He used the Son for what the purpose was. 1 Corinthians 15 and Ephesians 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. This is how God used him. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He had to have a preacher. Paul was ordained as a preacher, but he had to be saved. And he was. He received this message by revelation, Galatians 1. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins. We didn't kill the Lord. That was Peter's message. Christ died for our sins. Israel was trying to kill the Lord as hard as they could. They were trying to kill him just as hard as they could. Crucify, crucify him. And Jesus would not let them kill him naturally. He gave up the ghost and died himself as a living to dead sacrifice for us. He became that sacrifice of Ephesians chapter 5. He willingly gave up his life on this earth in that body that God gave him that he might die 
us read, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He did everything the scriptures said, and the devil didn't know it. You wonder why the devil hates Paul? Huh. It was revealed to Paul what Jesus did, and the devil hates him. Follow Paul and see what happens. I asked Brother Moore, we were sitting in the studio one time many years ago, talking, and boy, I had some incredible talks with Brother Moore. Things I would never relate to anybody, but we had some incredible talks, and we went to races together and talked. Brother Moore was a hard man to talk to. A lot of people couldn't talk to him. I I mean, not, I mean, he's just the way he was. He's Brother Moore. And I said, Brother Moore, why is it people don't believe? He said, I guess they just don't want it. He said, you know, there's no use of, <clears throat> use of us getting on the radio or TV if we're going to just preach the same old gospel that everybody else does on the TV. We have to preach the truth. But brother, why is it that you don't have much income and these preachers around you are just making wads of it? And he said, well, it's 1 Timothy 6. The love of money is the root of all evil. But that works two ways. He said, some people won't give nothing, but they won't expect all of it. They expect me to come and preach and not give me anything. Then there's others that carry the load. I said, well, that ain't right, is it? And he said, no, but there ain't nothing you do about it. He said, you can't let it de deter you from what you do because people are going to be what they are. I said, well, if they don't give, why don't they, they lose their fruit? I don't want anybody to lose their fruit, but I ain't about to beg nobody. You know why? You got to be cheerful. Well, the same thing with about Paul. Paul could have bucked at this, seeing what he saw. And yet 1 Corinthians 9, he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. It's committed unto him anyway. I always think about it. If something's committed to you, just go ahead and do it anyway. Everybody has a ministry in the body of Christ. Everybody has a calling in the body of Christ. Do it. Do it cheerfully and reap the benefits of it eternally. But maybe you don't believe in that eternal reaping. Then you better read your Bible some more because there is an eternal reaping. The judgment seat of Christ is called a happy judgment. Mice. It's a happy judgment to see whether you really were happy with what God gave you and did for you. Well, Paul was happy because look what he says in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, knowing what the devil was going to do to him. That which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Jesus died willingly. They were trying to kill him, but he gave up that ghost so that he is dying for our sins. And that he was buried. He went into hell for three days, his soul in torment, taking the judgment of our sins. And then God forgave us and raised his son. We were holy and without blame before him in love. He took us up there. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men to tell the men with gifts, the preachers, to tell the men what Jesus Christ and God the Father had done for them. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. And Paul was ordained that preacher. And any preacher that's a man of God is going to follow Paul. Otherwise, they're wasting your time. Amen.